This is the Ruckus and the Menace Sports Podcast. Oh no! We suck again! I'm getting confused. What game are you calling? I'm calling both games. It is caught by Kelsey! Touchdown! Kansas City! Anthony for three. Bang! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ruckus and the Menace episode number 79 of our sports podcast. I am Ruckus, always causing a ruckus. I'm Spence the Menace. And on this episode, we'll get into the starting lineup, the good, bad, and ugly, the high heat, the color commentary, our film room, and our stud and dud. So, let's get right into our first segment of the night, starting lineup. I was going to let you take over baseball, but we'll kind of split this off as... The first major move is that the Reds signed Nick Martinez and the Mets signed Yankees former Yankee pitcher Luis Severino. The Reds picking up Nick Martinez from the Padres, I believe, will bolster their rotation a bit a bit more while while the Mets have struggled with pitching and Severino should be able to cause a boost there. But yet one major trade in the offseason as winter meetings have kind of started to kick off. Take it away, Rex. All right. So a payroll shed that uh, the Mariners needed to do was, one, get rid of uh, their starting left fielder, Jared Kalanick, which I believe played right for most of the, the uh, for the Mariners. And then Marco Gonzalez, the left-handed pitcher, for um, the Mariners is also going to the Braves in exchange for a former Royal Jackson Coar and some other uh, prospects from the Braves. And it, from the sound of it, from what I've re- listened to on a uh, winter meetings first day thing, is that they want to get rid of Marco Gonzalez as soon as they can to shut off cap to get more players. All right, Spenis, what else do you got for us? Well, some major some major MLB awards honors is that Liam Hendricks and Cody Bellinger, both of Chicago, are the comeback players of the year in their respective leagues. And Orioles pitcher and Brewers pitcher Felix Bautista and Devin Williams were named the top relievers of the year. Andre Dawson has asked the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown to change the hat on his plaque from the Expos to the Cubs. And two new advisors have joined the Dodgers. Um, can you the explain a little bit stick. on why Andre Dodson wants to change his hat from the Expos to the Cubs? I mean, he played for both teams in his he played for both teams in his career. But I guess there but I would be looking in it's saying that he spent more of his, I don't know if it was something where it was more of his time. He played, was drafted by the Expos and played only 186 minor league games before joining the parent club. But he wants to switch it. Wants to switch it to and saying that he did not approve of the Expos hat for his plaque when the ba- when the Baseball Writers Association of America voted him in in 2010. Okay. So they put him in so they basically put him in as an Expo when he really wanted to go in as a cup. And then the two the two advisors for the new advisors for the Dodgers are Chris Archer and the boomstick Nelson Cruz. And now we move on from baseball to basketball as the eight teams that form that form the quarterfinals of the in-season tournament have been officially named. In the Western Conference, you have the Lakers 
the Suns as the wild card, and the Pelicans, along with the Sacramento Kings. And in the Eastern Conference, you have the Indiana Pacers, the Milwaukee Bucks, the Boston Celtics, and the Knicks as the wild card. Tonight, later on tonight, the Kings will play the Pelicans, and the Pacers and Celtics are in action right now with the Pacers up by four with just over a minute to go. And this is win or go home. This is single elimination. Tomorrow, the Lakers will play the Suns and the Bucks will play the Knicks. And now that we've gotten through our starting lineup, it is time for that Eastwood segment. Roll that beautiful tumbleweed there, Ruckus. Yes, sir. Yo, what happened to the sound clip? It's there. I just played it. You just can't hear it. <laughs> See, this is why we can't have nice things, because obviously, also, it's not your fault, Spenis. It's Discord Nitro's fault. Uh, Discord Nitro, can you help a homie out and... Um, give Spenis a um, or gift him a membership for Discord Nitro P- please and thank you so you could actually hear it and we don't have this uh, ever issue happen ever again anyways rant gone uh, what is good in sports this week and that is the Jim Leland is going to Cooperstown most notably known for taking the 1997 Marlins as a wild card team to the World Series and where they stunned the Cleveland Indians. And, and I'm going to go straight from the good to the not so good because this needed to come out. Though the good is eventually going to come next year with the college football playoff expanding. The college football playoff teams being announced kind of led to a lot of bad. And the first part of it is, is that Michigan is going to play Alabama and Texas will play Washington. Florida State, who is undefeated and had dealt with probably some of the best making lemonade out of lemons, has been snubbed. And even Liberty, who also is undefeated, is not going to be playing, or is not going to be playing in a major, in a major game as well. Ah, sad Liberty, Liberty. Actually, wait, no, Liberty is actually playing in. They'll be playing in a bowl. They'll still be playing in what would have been a BCS bowl. They're still going to be like they're not in the playoffs, but they're going to play in a in a BCS type game and they'll actually be playing Oregon in the Happy Fiesta Liberty. Bowl. Happy Liberty Bifferty. Yep. But we will not pick any of these games between Michigan and Alabama or Texas and Washington yet. Those will be coming much closer to the time of their they're being played, which will which will likely be the episode after Christmas, is I think when we pick the first round of this. Yep. And now that we've gotten through the bad that probably could have been uglier, what's the actual ugly for sports um, this week? Um. Well, um, it involves a certain Oklahoma City Thunder basketball player named Josh Giddy, which is actually originated from Australia, the Aussie. Uh, he is, legal, he's an Aussie. Um, he, his legal situation involving a relationship between Giddy and an alleged underage girl. Well, the, from what I've been kind of seeing things here and there, the, the alleged, the alleged per- party involved other than Giddy has not been cooperative according to some and also there's been allegations of of the the person that the person of interest or at least the person involved 
lied about their age in trying to actually extort, like to try and actually cause more harm. But get it's ugly, but Giddy has he has technically a way out. But the way out is not necessarily very pr- very pretty. And it's sad because he's only 21. He's only just old enough to drink a beer in this country. He's probably been drinking it uh, before that, too, because... Well, drinking age, drinking ages outside of here are lower. Yeah, 18 is their drinking age over in, in Australia. You're welcome. That was the only joke I'm going to make there that's actually kind of tasteful. Um, anyways, high heat time. Yep, it is time for the main event of what we have, which kind of is spanned across two segments. Our high heat and our color commentary, which will be a continuation mostly of the later games. These will be some of the games that were Thursday night and early. The first one we have here is the Cowboys defeating the Seahawks 41 to 35. The question is, can the Cowboys catch up to the Eagles and win the NFC East? Especially after events that we will talk about later and the two teams playing each other here soon. And can the Seahawks keep their playoff hopes roll afloat amidst a tough stretch of games that they have coming up? That stretch including San Francisco. Stretch including San Francisco. And then also... Well, they have San Francisco and Philadelphia. But then the schedule lightens up for them on the back end. As then they take on, after Philadelphia, the Titans, the Steelers, and the Cardinals. So the question uh, is, which one? Do, which question do we want to answer first? Um, I'm gonna answer the first one first. If the cow, here's the thing: Cowboys. The Cowboys will eventually catch up to the Eagles, but do we think that they're, um, depending on how the momentum shifts for the Cowboys and for the Eagles? I think. If the Eagles played like they did against the 49ers this past week, um, maybe the Cowboys uh, make it close. But I don't know if they beat the Eagles to win the NFC East. Or in general, I don't think I don't know if they actually win the East. I think the Eagles might beat them to it. We'll see. Um, that didn't really directly answer the question. Um, I but... think that game. I think that game does provide a benefit but the Cowboys also do not have an easy stretch of games coming up as their next four are the Eagles the Bills the Dolphins and the Lions before they close out with the Commanders so the Cowboys so in order for the Cowboys to get through They are going to have to beat Philadelphia and then run the table the rest of the way. Yeah. Because I think the Eagles' schedule does ease up for them a little more, as the Eagles, after playing Dallas, will have Seattle, the Giants, the Cardinals, and then the Giants again. So I think due to due to just having an easier strength of schedule down the stretch, I believe that the Eagles will be a repeat winner of the NFC East for the first time in years. However, Seattle's schedule, with it being, they are going through a tough stretch of games right now with playing the 49ers twice and the Dallas Cowboys and Eagles. But once they get out of this tunnel, that they're currently seeing some of the light at the end of. 
they have the Titans, the Steelers, and the Cardinals, which I th- think could be just enough pending other outside forces that happen that they could potentially be right there in the mix also, for a playoff spot. Also, shout out to Mr. Nice Guy for his uh, Seahawks. You know, you know where you... <laughs> That's his favorite team from uh, Seattle, Washington. Yeah, he's a Seattle native. Yep. The next one, Lions 33, Saints 28. And the question here is, has Sam Laporta further cemented and staked the claim that the Iowa Hawkeyes are tight end university? He's a bad man. Sam Laporta. Bad man. That's all I have to say. Sorry. There are some there are some good Iowa tight ends that have made the NFL. You have Dallas Clark. You have Scott Chandler. You have Brandon Myers. Tony Moyaki. But some of the guys that have easily made their way to the tight at the tight end position. Noah Fant is also an Iowa Hawk or was also an Iowa Hawkeye. I didn't even know. TJ Hawkinson. And TJ Hawkinson. George Kittle. You had Dallas Clark you had Dallas Clark there. So they, so, and now Laporta has just added another stake into, into the claim of being a tight end from what potentially could very well be tight end university. And there's some people known also for being like the people's tight end. It's and some people say that it's not Iowa, but the Hawkeyes are close. But I think that this could very well. I think if Iowa produces maybe another two or three more that are this productive, like Laporta, Kittle, they've got it. They will eventually. I think they will eventually get it. Yeah, that they will officially be known as tight end university. But uh, I was right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Texans Broncos. 22, Broncos 17. And this question more is centered around the winning streak of the Broncos. Was this defeat and snapping of their streak an aberration or a sign of things to come for Broncos country? I think my the very, very famous words that I have said on the podcast that Salty Waters loves to hear me say, Broncos country, let's die. You're welcome, Saul. But in all seriousness, yes, the Broncos are, I think they had a lucky stretch there, and they had some sneaky little wins here and there. And... Against the Texans, where the Texans intercepted Wilson in the most famous way of, like, throwing in the red zone. Yeah, you blew it. I think, I don't think it's completely let's, let's die, let, or even let's hide at this point. I think it's Broncos country, let's fight. Let's fight. Because... Because they have four out of their last five games. The only one of difficulty is the Lions. The only one of difficulty is Detroit. They have two against the Chargers, which anything can happen. One more against the Raiders. Kind of 
a game that you really want to fight and stay in. But the game that is in the middle of the first stint with the Chargers and the Lions and before the second stint to the Chargers, the Patriots. That is a very winnable game for Denver. And if they don't win that game, they may as well hang it up and call it quits for the season. So Denver really, I think they have a chance to stay hot and make this really be just an aberration that can kind of light a fire under them, especially because they were still in it. So the key really for them is going into this matchup with the Chargers to not let this loss and how this one ended snowball in order to keep themselves alive in the hunt for a playoff spot. I know they're both a- I know it's an AFC West team and you don't really care because it's Chiefs. Chiefs for you. But right. this is really the only way that they're going to fight them to I mean fight themselves out of potentially falling into a hole. They looked kind of like they were coming back whenever Sutton had that touchdown, but yeah, I, yeah. I think the Texans are the better team in this scenario, obviously. Yeah, the Texans are the better team. Texans are the better team. But not without a fight. Not without a fight and a pretty darn good one. Yeah. The next one here, the only one that went to overtime. Colts 31, Titans 28. Along with Houston winning... And Jacksonville looking like they are they are doing just fine. Well, now down seven to the Bengals. Does does the AFC South now all of a sudden become more competitive than what we realized or anticipated, especially for playoff spots in the AFC North also? getting involved has just the AFC gotten more competitive especially right around the bottom seeds um to uh put a little uh so has the AFC all of a sudden become more competitive uh for the AFC South, um, I believe so. So the Colts are like kind of crawling, it seems, for the most part. They did lose their star running back that they uh, delayed coming into his debut for the season for like a couple games at the start of the year. But now he has a, uh, he's doing, getting thumb surgery. So he's going to be out for another, like, probably to like the, near end of the season possibly we'll see um yeah still have Gardner Minshew uh taking stride over that with the boss Colts. has been serviceable Michael Pittman you've still got Michael Pittman yep there's um the Colts still have plenty of weapons and the in the development of Josh Downs playing well has been has been a pleasant surprise for for Indianapolis as well. Yeah. I mean, the Titans have clearly been playing like an era has passed them by, but but where we're going with this is that it has gotten more competitive. And it will really be between the AFC North, the AFC South, and even possibly the Broncos and the AFC West. You may, you may run into a... You were possibly running into a mix with the Jets, but now it's going to be more so the Bills jockeying for position at this point. It's going to be really hard that some really high-quality team that potentially could be a sleeper in the playoffs is going to miss out. Yeah, and if you're the Bills... um in this sense, you would have to like really like hone in on 
trying not to lose in overtime as well because like that's really what they could have won the game against um the Eagles last week but they uh missed that uh catch by Davis but other than that like yeah you you got to limit the mistakes just regardless of which team you are that AFC playoff race is a pressure cooker it is a pressure cooker right now because you have Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Indianapolis, Houston, Denver, Buffalo, Cincinnati. Cincinnati right now in their leading with Jacksonville. They can make this interesting. The Chargers are still hanging around. The Raiders and the Jets and Titans are long shots, but but still could play spoiler for some of these teams that they still have to play that are further up the further up the ranking and the seeding. I think we're going to be at the point that the AFC it's going to come down to likely the final week. Probably the final few hours of the seat of the regular season. I think we'll probably see a lot of AFC games get flexed to the four o'clock slot. Sounds like it. Because all of their records are kind of smashed up together like a like a traffic jam on four ninety five. I know that most of our audience is probably more so in that KCMO area. But if we have a Beltway audience and you know 495, that area gets jammed up all the time, especially during rush hour. Next one, Cardinals 24, Steelers 10, and then we will have the lowest scoring game of the of the day. Chargers 6, Patriots nothing. And really, the question we have here is, what are we to make of any of these offenses, the Cardinals, the Steelers, the Chargers, or even the Patriots, going Um, forward? What are we to make of it? So, if uh, I wanted to channel my inner Skinner, Principal Skinner, that is, from The Simpsons, in that meme for the offenses, I would say for both the Chargers and the Patriots, um, uh, I would say pathetic. Um, as the Chargers only scored two field goals against the Patriots, which is a dumpster fire of an offense right now. Kicker, the kicker managed to win him a game. Yep, and then the Cardinal Steelers. I think it was just more so that uh, I feel like Kyler and company really just stood up against the Steelers. The Steelers are kind of a mixed bag when it comes to both their offense and their defense at times, and it showed here against the Cardinals. I think just having Kyler's presence there really helps for the Cardinals, even though um, some of their weapons are gone. Like, they still have Connor and... Wait. Oh, James Connor had a huge game. James Connor had a huge game. Hollywood Brown had nothing. Hollywood Brown did nothing. What about Dorch? Dorch was... I feel like Dorch didn't do much either. Interesting. Um... Oh, Dorch only had two points. Dorch only had two points. Really, it was just Connor. Really, it was just Connor. James Connor was having a huge game. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know what to really think about the Steelers, but I do know that the Chargers Patriots offense is pathetic. I think a bad, I think a major injury to Kenny Pickett, plus really the dysfunction of them firing Matt Canada and not really having a very strong, really having a very strong setup going into it. Kind of hurts, kind of hurts the Steelers. I think their offense is going to be what's going to hold them back. 
then the Chargers and Patriots. The Patriots also suffering a bad injury that may force a player to miss some time. And that is Ramondre Stevenson. He was a non-participant in today's practice. Injured his ankle and is believed to be dealing with a sprain. And it's a short week as the as the Steelers and Patriots will play each other. And for the Steelers, it's playoff it's playoff on the line. I think they'll beat New England because New England is just absolutely garbage. Garbage. It garbage. We gotta throw that garbage in the harbor. I don't think you would want to throw it in the harbor because it would pollute the water. Although the water's already dirty in Boston anyway. <laughs> Just put it in Central Park. I didn't even hear that. Or You're at welcome. least hear that fully. <laughs> and it was garbage anyways. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move on to the late games. Buccaneers 21, Panthers 18, with three of their final five games, including their last two in division. Can the Bucs either play spoiler or even have a great chance of winning the division? That being the NFC South. I have some faith in the Buccaneers as they are number two in their division tied with the Saints, five and seven. Um, I think they pull ahead because you still have your uh, targets in Mike Evans and Chris Godwin for the most part. And then you still have Mayfield and Rashad White. Yeah, Rashad I, White has been playing great ball, like good ball. And lately. I think... I think they rip the dumb mustache right off of Artie Smith's face. And uh, show yeah. the Falcons who's boss. The Falcons are playing very interesting football. Like, uh, it's... It's interesting in the sense that it's really not doing much of anything. But at the same time, it's still... It's still them doing something. Like, they're not blowing anybody out of the water. Like, they're just winning ugly. Like, well, every single They're not really sinking win, any ships. They're just kind of damaging them. We're just throwing them. We're just putting enough into it to kind of throw something off course. They've only like they won last week against the Jets thirteen to eight. Well, they didn't even really put a man overboard or walk the plank. They're just kind of like, uh, all right, retreat, retreat. Yeah, and I think the only way the Buccaneers ultimately lose some sort of leverage for playoffs is if they burn the boats and all of a sudden they don't. They burn the boats to try and fight their way in solving the problems, and they lose, or and they and they get beat. Tampa Bay's next few games are Atlanta, Green Bay, Jacksonville, New Orleans, Carolina. That's the five game stretch. Green Bay's been playing hot right now. Yep. So that's a so that's a crapshoot. Jacksonville's good. Jacksonville's always a talented team, but they're beatable. So there's ways that there's ways that Tampa Bay can make it happen, and I think we see them coming up. The next one: Rams thirty six, Browns nineteen. The big question here is, have the Rams found the way and the formula for keeping Miles Garrett in check? And how does finding this solution affect the Browns in the AFC North race? 
Um, I you gotta have a consistent offense and a consistent defense in order to really uh, make that solution a reality for the Browns to win the AFC North. Um, they've been shaky, and when it comes to the standings as it goes right now, I mean, the Bengals are in last place, but you have two teams tied for second right now with the Steelers and Browns, and both teams are kind of hit or miss when it comes to certain aspects of their game. You don't have Deshaun Watson for the Browns, but you do have Joe Flacco, which just got added. Um, but you have inconsistencies with your wide receivers and your tight end and Joku has been in and out. Uh, the Steelers, with their stuff, it's more so now Kenny Pickett is uh, hurt. So you really Mitchell Trubisky is got... now kicking in and and oh, no. his entry to it has made things very, very interesting. Update I... on that, the Bengals and Jaguars are tied at 21. Nice. But yeah, I don't know. I think um, the Browns are just on a thread right now. They're just hanging on a loose thread. The Rams had a good game against them with Nakua. Nakua had a good game. Um, he has a sprained AC joint for the for the future of it. Who Nakua? Nakua. Yep. Damn. There goes my fantasy. Um. All right. 49ers Eagles. Well, or do I think we. To say? I think there's still the favorite. The favorite to win the division for the AFC North is currently idle, and that is the Baltimore Ravens. I think the Baltimore Ravens will probably win the division. They have the easiest road, although their road is tough. Their road is definitely not as difficult to get out of. The next one, yep, we're going to go 49ers 42, Eagles 19. Does this game give clarity as to who is the favorite to win the NFC? And how does the signing of Shaq Leonard affect the Eagles defense following this loss to the Niners? Okay. Um, so that question about uh, the clarity for who's going to win the NFC, um, because aren't are the Niners in the East or no, 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 they're in the they're in the West. Okay, and for the Niners, their guys are the Rams, Seahawks, and Cardinals. You currently have the Seahawks and Rams uh, tied for second. There's a lot of teams tied for second nowadays. Jeez, uh, the 49ers are nine and three. They're in the same boat in a sense when it comes to what the Ravens are in with AFC North. Mind you, it's like by a few wins and losses here and there, but it's kind of like the same thing in a sense. Um, the Niners, I think it's pretty clear-cut as long as they're healthy and the players are being consistent with their production like they have been, they'll be pretty good. As far as the Eagles go, though, um, I... I don't know. They've been very inconsistent from the start of the year, and it's been that consistency has still been iffy with their offense. And it's shown. Obviously, uh, when they played against the Chiefs, uh, that defense was scary and fierce, like it has been. And our offense was not uh, consistent either. But. I don't know what that means for the Eagles as far as the NFC East. Um, the Niners look like they're going to be the clear favorite to uh, win their NFC West division. Kind of like how the Ravens are kind of the favorite there. But anyways, uh, the signing of Shaq Leonard to the Eagles. To me, I don't remember when Namak and Sue was signed. Yeah, it's kind of comparatively. 
It's kind of comparatively in terms of signing, signing wise. Uh... I don't think that. I think that we won't. I don't think this gives any clarity to what to what this last game is going to look like for the for the NFC. It's like I don't think it's going to be a oh. fa- like. I don't think it gives any clarity as to who's going to win the NFC as far as the NFC championship. Oh, I was just there's, looking up when... Not. Sorry. Uh, I was looking up when um, Amakin Sue was signed, actually, just out of clarity to figure out, because it feels like not too long ago, and it's already been more than a year since uh, Amakin Sue got signed to help bolster that uh, defense for the Eagles. It's actually been a year and about a... Well, a year and like two weeks since the Nomican Sioux signing for the Eagles. And now yep. it, it, Shaq Leonard has been signed to the Eagles. I don't know if he really puts, if he, I don't know if he's going to get as many snaps as he would have if he uh, stayed with the Colts. Cause like the main concern with Shaq was he was not getting as many snaps. Satisfied with his snaps Colts. following a back surgery. Yep. And I don't know what that means for the Eagles. Maybe it's it boosts it a little bit. Maybe he adds a little bit of energy to a defense that might get tired over time. Maybe he like rotates with like Reddick or maybe he rotates with another linebacker. I don't really know their linebacker room all that well. But I thought Hassan Reddick was like a linebacker of some sort, like an outside linebacker. Yeah, I think I think Leonard I think Shaq plays more. Why do I think he is more of an inside linebacker, not an like a outside? Mike? Would you say he's a Mike or? Yeah, I think he's the inside. I think he's an inside linebacker. So I think he's primarily played the middle. Yeah. All right, what was your thought on the uh, clarity side of things here for the NFC? Or did you already yeah. talk? Yeah, I don't think it I don't think it gives anything because because timing is different. Yes, Hassan and to confirm with you, Hassan Reddick is the strong side linebacker and it would be moving Shaq Leonard to the middle. He is a middle linebacker. So who was their middle linebacker before Shaq decided to... Uh, uh, I think it's Nic- Nicholas Morrow. Okay, so when Shaq Leonard entered the chat, now Morrow's probably like the second runner-up yeah. in case Shaq gets yeah. there. Yeah, and then Zach Cunningham also just got hurt, which led to them taking the signing. So who knows? It may possibly be that if that somebody moves over to the weak side. Yep. And it makes it interesting. And now for the last game before the Monday Nighter, Packers 27, Chiefs 19. I know Ruckus definitely did not want me to throw this in there, but the question is, are the Packers getting hot at the right time to make an unexpected playoff push? All right, I'm going to say this one thing. I don't think it was unexpected for them to take a playoff push because they played really good in the Thanksgiving game against the Lions, which the Lions are notoriously known for losing on Thanksgiving. But Yeah, but we expected them to be a lot rockier coming out of this with Jordan Love at the quarterback and really not much going on. Yeah, true. And they also didn't have Aaron Jones in that game against the Chiefs, but it didn't really matter because Dylan kicked ass and... uh Really Christian just, Watson, Jordan yeah. Love, Christian Jordan Love was having a having a great game. Like Jordan Love has shown in spurts that he can be a franchise quarterback for this Packers team. They were showing the stats that it was like exactly the same stats between Rodgers and Love whenever they were playing the showing the game last night. And here we have we have the Packers next few games, the Giants, the Buccaneers, the Panthers, the Vikings, the Bears. 
So the schedule lightens up a lot more for the Packers to be able to do this. I feel like and the, the Packers, pa- I think. I feel like the Vikings are going to be probably the toughest opponent out of all of that. I'm, I'm going to say the Bucks. I'm going to say that the Bucks. Too. But I think it's mainly. I'm going to say the, the Bucks, but the Vikings. But with the Vikings one, they will. The Packers will have to deal with Justin Jefferson likely being back. You also have to deal with that nasty secondary of the Vikings with Bynum and. Um, uh, I'm blanking. Harrison Smith and a few others. Yeah. So that. So that down the line puts them in a very, very interesting spot. But I think Green Bay has a chance, especially with how open the middle of the NFC can be. And especially because their record is right now holding up to the point that they can hold a spot very, very well. Well, hopefully they flourish and and, uh, blossom into something great. I would like to see it, honestly. Yep. And now we go to the Packers have been good. Go ahead. Yep, and now and now we go to the film room where we had a big scoring day. But heading into this week, and with ETN getting a touchdown, I picked up three more points. And now Ruckus is down thirteen going into this week. And this week because Ruckus will not be available next week, we had to put in some college football bowl games. And the question will now become, who do we have going into these college football games? The first one here The Army versus Navy. Um, so there was this very um uh, famous song in Dance Dance Revolution, and I hope you know the tune because in the Navy. Um obviously I picked Navy over Army. I have people that I know who have been on the Naval Academy, or in the Naval Academy, not on the football team. I also know people who have gone up to West Point, which is Army. But more of my family in terms of military have been Navy. So I generally will say, go Navy, beat Army. So I am taking Navy. The the next one here, and this is the first bowl game. The Myrtle Beach Bowl. Georgia Southern versus Ohio. Georgia Southern at 6-6 six and six versus Ohio at 9-3. and three. I'll have to say Ohio. Shout out to my man, uh, Seti B, Cedric Brown. I'm taking Ohio. Jacksonville State versus Louisiana in the RNL Carriers New Orleans Bowl. Um. Jacksonville State is eight and four, while Louisiana is six and six. I'm going to pick Jackson State or Jacksonville. I am taking Jacksonville State and my guys, uh, Jacob Barrick and Gerard Bowie. Shout out to the Bulldogs. To the Martinsburg Bulldogs for that one. Miami Uh, of Ohio, the alma mater of Ben Roethlisberger, versus Appalachian State. Appalachian State, baby. I'm taking App State as well because they they knocked off JMU. New Mexico State versus Fresno State. I'm going to take New Mexico. 
even though I have no idea if they're good or bad. I just think New Mexico well, and I think Yeah, the bad. avocados were Miami, Ohio and Appalachian State were the avocados from Mexico Cure Bowl. This one is the Isleta New Mexico Bowl. The next one is the LA Bowl between UCLA and Boise State. The 7 and 5 UCLA Bruins versus the 8 and 5 Boise State Broncos. I got UCLA and so does Spenis. Yep, I I switched it. I took I initially was going to take Boise but home home field UCLA. Cal versus Texas. The next Tech. one here. Cal versus Texas Tech in the Radiance Technologies Independence Bowl. I'm going to take Texas Tech because that is uh, Patrick Mahomes' is, uh, alma mater right there. It's the alma mater of the State Farm Bowl. I'm taking Cal. And then our last college football one, the 7-5 Western Kentucky Hilltoppers versus the old ODU, Old Dominion. Famously the alma mater of Taylor Heineke. And take the Hilltoppers. I'm taking Western Kentucky here. And in the NFL, we start with the Brown, the Browns, and the Jaguars. I'm gonna take the Jaguars. Duval. Du. Oh, I am taking I am taking the Jaguars as well and I need to make sure that my uh, Duvals on on the channel involve just three U's the Buccaneers <laughs> and the Falcons uh, I'm taking the Bucks because the Falcons don't really know their identity it's like the eyes of the Falcon were like stripped out and it's just kind of flying around all right. I'm taking uh, the buck in the, I'm taking the bucks. Ravens, Rams. Ravens, Rams. I am Ravens. taking. We both took the Ravens. And then the next one after that, the Vikings and the Raiders. Dinka Dinka Durkin. I'm taking the Vikings. I am taking the Raiders. I think Antonio Pierce has something going on here. And that something going on has been real surprisingly been really, really good. Like it's been one of those like it's one of those they are they're looking like I think Antonio Pierce is Keeping his job. 49ers Seahawks. Picking the Niners for this one because I think the Seahawks get uh pummeled a little bit, but it probably might become might come down to a close game, but who knows? It's the NFL. I think the 49ers in that one. And then Bill's Chiefs. Come on, Chiefs. I know you can do it. It's been a hell of a ride so far, and God almighty, please win this one against the Bills. We have bad juju against the Bills at, um, I don't know if they're, are they It's an arrowhead. Oh, shit. It's an arrowhead. Um, yeah, we have bad juju, and we've lost our past couple regular season games at arrowhead to the Bills, but... That was because um, their team was actually coached fairly better than it has been uh, since uh, this year. And But I don't know. The Chiefs offense show, did not show up. Um, 
last <laughs> last game, it was pretty bad. I think and... the Bills play with more urgency than because they are they are on the outside looking in. And I think if the Bills if the Bills want to even stand a chance of making the playoffs, they got to win out and they got to play with urgency. Yeah. Anyways, I picked the ne- Chiefs. Their next couple of their next few games are not easy. They got the Chiefs, the Cowboys, and then they then it soften up, softens up a bit with the Chargers and the Patriots, but then they finish off with Miami. So they're on a hard stretch before a nice little soft middle. Then a hard stretch, then a hard, hard game, and right at the end, where Miami may even sit starters. And lastly, the Cowboys and the Eagles. I'm going with the Cowboys. How about them Cowboys? And I'm not going to be mad if uh, they lose, like Stephen A. Smith would be. Um, what do you think, Spennis? Okay. Wait for it. Wait, wait for what? Fly, Eagles, fly on the road to victory. Fight, 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 Eagles, fight. And it, and basically, it ends with E A G L E S, Eagles. Go birds! Man, it almost seems Eagles. like you're being paid to uh, pick for the Eagles at this point with all this enthusiasm. Why? With me picking the Eagle? Yeah. Like, it just seems... I don't know. May, I don't know. I'm Maybe I'm just a dirty Chiefs fan. I'm a Commanders fan. The Cowboys are the spawn of Satan. <laughs> I don't really like picking the Cowboys for much of anything. <laughs> that'll be the title for this episode the cowboys are the spawn of satan <laughs> the cowboys are an accident waiting to happen <laughs> insert Stephen a joint here <laughs> so i definitely am picking against the cowboys and i think the eagles definitely will us uh, assert themselves as repeat NFC East champions. And now to our anytime touchdown scorers. Right, Same I rules apply. Same rules as last week apply. Go right ahead. Alright, so I got my three players are CD Lamb of the Cowboys, Travis Kelsey, number 87 of the Kansas City Chiefs, and Josh Allen, and for this one, he would have to get a running touchdown in order for it to count. Yes, he has to get a, he has to get a rushing he has to get a rushing touchdown. All right, Spennis, fire away. My three are going to be a li- might be a little bit easier to obtain, and they are David Montgomery of the Lions. Christian McCaffrey of the 49ers, and probably my outside shot, Michael Pittman Jr. of the Indianapolis Colts. And that will and that will do it for the film room. Three. Ten. Fifteen. Eighteen. Twenty-one. 28 points at stake this week. Excluding the excluding the anytime touchdown scores, because if we get all three, it becomes 31. Our stud and dud of the week. Ruckus, go ahead and start it out. Alright, so I will start out with my all roll mention for stud, and that is Overland Park, Kansas native Jason Sudeikis playing the drums at Allen Fieldhouse in Lawrence, Kansas, as it was a game where the Jayhawks beat the Yukon Huskies, I believe, right? Or am I did I butcher that? Uh yeah, yeah, it was it was definitely uh It was definitely the Yukon Huskies, yes. Okay, I was just trying to make sure. 
And then my stud for this week, thank you for uh, correcting my stuff. Dylan Johnson, 28 rushes for 152 yards against the Oregon Ducks in the Pac-12 championship win for Washington. Uh, that is my stud. And then for my dud... Yeah. And you went with and you initi- and initially it would have been more of a dud if you would have went through with that. Because you had Deontay Johnson, which would have been the wide receiver for Pittsburgh. <laughs> so I'm shush, glad shush, I shush, caught shush. that. Um and then my dud for the week, which is kind of a lame one and a dead giveaway, but the Iowa Hawkeyes just not score doing anything against Michigan. They didn't even wave a white Cheaters. flag. Uh, <laughs> hey, at least they didn't bang any. At least they didn't bang any trash cans. Who cares? They cheated. <laughs> but uh, but and... it was kind of to be. It, it was kind of to be expected. Twenty six to nothing. Iowa was not on Michigan's level. My honorable mention this week goes to my home down my hometown Bulldogs winning the state championship over Princeton on Saturday at Wheeling Island Stadium, pretty much also known as the Island of the Dogs. As this this state championship has been their is their tenth since two thousand ten. And Coach Walker, who came back, this was his first season back after a few few year after a couple of years at Concord. This was his ninth state championship. So, so kind of nice to have a state championship come home. But then my stud this week goes to Buccaneers wide receiver Mike Evans, who we've mentioned a little bit earlier. He posted his 10th career 1,000-yard season. and That's basically every season of his career. Likely further making his case for Canton. My honorable mention dud this week goes to Panthers ed- edge rusher Brian Burns for getting ejected by shoving a helmet of a Buccaneer lineman because because of something he said to trigger him to throw the punch. But the real dud here was Dre Greenlaw and the Eagles head of security getting into a fight that resulted in both of them getting tossed. And wait, what? What? Why are you adding an honorable mention now? I just now thought of it when you were talking about Brian Burns. Uh, are you? Um, I'll. Uh, are you ready to do your dud yeah. or? Oh, I've already gone through my dud. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, so I kind of wanted to end, add this on the last at the last minute. Isaiah Pacheco punching a Packers player at the end of the near the end of the game, like. Um. Uh, getting actually uh uh disqualified from the game probably getting a uh fine of some sort but yeah that, that that's pretty much it anyways yeah i didn't see anything as far as like that would go the replay showed that he punched a dude and then they like made a big deal about it at the end it was like and that same, it was like before they did that drive where like they had no timeouts and they were trying to go for the last uh, hoorah or whatever. And that was the same drive where uh, MBS uh, didn't get called for pass interference. It was just a frustration thing. Anyways, are we ready? Yep, go ahead and take us out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to the Ruckus in the Mess Sports Podcast, episode number 79. I I am Ruckus. That is the menace. And thank you for listening to our sports podcast. Also, thank you for watching our Super Bowl race videos. It does help out the channel a lot. And also, 
it get it gives me a lot of practice in general um uh, doing like uh sports casting kind of things i really like the sports casting thing uh, side of things but it's just been a lot of fun so far and this episode for me i believe i'm facing the bills actually because last week i said i was facing the bills were really Spenis corrected me and i'm actually was actually playing the raiders but this week for sure is the bills one and that will be a fun one to watch uh go check that one out and also go check out Spenis's. go ahead Spenis. yep and this one for me is on thursday i will be releasing our matchup for the jaguars against the tampa bay buccaneers as we're working our way to home field advantage and definitely stay tuned as we go through and we now have all of our regular season content in the hopper. Um, you will have all of that by Christmas time. So the playoff so the playoffs will begin after Christmas. And we'll decide whether or not we want to do it as a premiere or just figure it out later. But anyways, uh, yeah. uh that has been this has been a Ruckus and the Menace sports podcast production. I am Ruckus. And I'm Spence the Menace. We'll see you guys later. Yep. Deuces.